Hey, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for everybody for being here. I want to extend a huge thank you to my family, my friends, and my advisor for all the help this past year. And with that, I hope you enjoy my presentation. I hope you think it's as hip as I do. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit about me. I'm a graduating senior here at Grandview, and I've been a four-year member of the Technology Student Association. Serving two years as a chapter secretary, and a year as state officer at large, as well as a year as state vice president. I'm also a four-year member of Future Business Leaders of America here, as well as a two-year member of National Honor Society. Next year, I'll be attending the University of Colorado at Boulder, where I'll be studying chemical and biological engineering, as well as Spanish and biomedical engineering in the global engineering program. I plan on attending med school in the future, so this is kind of my first step in that direction. As also, I'm passionate about community service, and I've been volunteering with the Dependent Plan for the past four and a half years. The main inspiration I had in this project was my grandfather. He had a hip replacement surgery done about two years ago now, and I got really curious and started researching on what really a hip replacement surgery is. And I was shocked to find that the average lifespan of a hip replacement surgery is 15 years. You take away a year for a recovery period after the surgery, and you're down only 14 years on a hip that's been replaced. I was also fascinated by the strength of the hip, and the overall function and the common nature of the hip is really amazing because it's one of the most commonly replaced joints in the human body. The main description of my project is I created a replacement joint firm and I was focusing on next generation designs and innovative approaches to hip replacement surgeries as well as other joint replacement surgeries. In addition, I wanted to increase the lifespan and decrease the pain and improve the overall design and functionality of a hip replacement joint. Now, for my project, I had several project objectives. I wanted to learn how joints function within the human body and I also wanted to develop a set timekeeping strategy. I was just thinking about this last night, and I've been working on this project for one year and three weeks to the day. And you work on a project that's so long and so time consuming like this, requires a set timekeeping strategy in order to follow through and ultimately finish. Additionally, I want to explore the difficulties associated with hip replacement surgeries, as well as constructing a viable hip joint and, and, and a viable joint inside the body. My fourth objective was to increase my skills and practice with SOLIDWORKS so as to earn the next level certification, as well as become more proficient as I go into my future. And my final objective was to understand how biomedical engineers interact with the medical community in order to truly provide the highest quality of patient care. And with that, every good company needs a logo. So I chose a pretty simple logo that went well with my overall company name. The D and the R, as you'll see, are inside the femoral heads of a hip. There's also a replacement joints that's written on the top of the patella, which is the kneecap in your body. Uh, LLC is located on the femoral stem. And I use <laughs> simple colors that really the materials are used in a hip replacement joint or any joint surgery, for that fact. Gray is a metallic based color, which is used a lot of times for replacement surgery. There's also plastic, which is represented by the black you see in the femoral head. Tan is a ceramic reminiscent of a Hip, as you'll see in the red letters of replacement, and blue is more of a medical aspect of it. Now, every great company needs a great supporting staff and a great advising committee. So I have a great crew of advisors who really helped me out. Mr. Lamp Craig Landing, who's here today, thank you for coming, <laughs> is a professor at CU Denver in the bioengineering department. He researches biomedical device design, and he developed his own course called BioE 5063 that's really focused on 3D patient modeling. He's also a co-inventor in several patents, and he has experience designing hips and SOLIDWORKS. I also work closely with Dr. Anthony Petrella. He's a director of computational biomechanics at the Colorado School of Mines, and he has experience in the past working at the Key Orthopedics, a joint replacement manufacturing company. Also, he is currently modeling the spine, which is great because I've been modeling both myself here. My support advisors are Chase gordon -Yer, and he's great with SOLIDWORKS, he has a CSWP, and he's also provided moral support throughout this entire project. And the doctors who could not be here is a certified skull checker, and he also provided moral support to me. My uncle, Dr. Vladislav Merkula, is an occupational therapist, so he has experience treating patients with various types of injuries, and he also helped my grandfather with his recovery after, after his procedure. And my aunt, Yana Merkula, is a physical therapy assistant, so he has, she also has experience training with dealing, treating patients with these types of injuries, as well as she also helped my grandfather post-op. 
I use simple technology throughout my project. I use primarily my personal laptop as well as the school's computers. And when I got to the design phase, I used 3D Slicer, a program that allows you to take CT and diacom images of a hip or any part of the body and actually create a 3D model based off of that. And I was able to use that in the hand with SolidWorks to actually create my viable replacement joint that I ultimately produced with my final product. I also made use of Google, the Google Scholar, and the NHI database to find the majority of my research in order to truly ensure that my research was to the highest standard. On top of that, when I actually got down to producing my final joint, I used the Markforge Onyx printer, which allowed me to print carbon fiber, and that's what you'll see in these models today. Now, my research was very expensive because I had been working on this project for a year, and originally I wanted to do four separate joints, and I realized that wasn't a viable solution, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but my research was very expensive, and it took a majority of a year. I started off with a hip replacement structure, with the structure of the general hip as well. And I learned that very, I learned very quickly that there's a lot of different terms inside the body. It's an encyclopedia of sorts. So I'll walk you through some of the basic terms that I learned. Now the ox coxa, my final pointer, is this part right here. This is the hip bone of the human body. There's a cedabellar cup, which you'll see modeled in blue right here, and that's essentially the socket where the femoral head of the femur rests in the body, and that creates your hip joint. There's also the femur, which is the long bone that stretches from the top of your hip bone to your, from your coxa down to your knee. And that's the main bone that's involved in the hip right there. Hyaline cartilage is a surface lining of both the coxa as well as the femoral head, and it provides the necessary decrease in friction in order for the hip to actually move and perform its proper function. Now your hip also has a synovial membrane, and it secretes and stores synovial fluid in order to allow for the hip to move within the human body. There's also a marrow cavity. The marrow cavity is typically used in stem replacements, which is the majority of hip replacements as well. And the marrow cavity is essentially the place where your hip, uh, where your hip's replacement joint stem rests, and that's the place where they hammer it into the body. I went further and I found that the hip joint itself is incredible. It holds up the entire weight of your body and forces on this joint at, up, at upwards of five times your body weight. And now that can be up to 900 newtons at a time. So for my physics geeks, that's a lot of force. There's also a force that extends down from your hip and your leg, and it's able to spread this force out throughout the, throughout the entire joint. Now, this is also a ball and socket joint, and one amazing thing is that your hip is technically able to circumduct 360 degrees in a circle, and its the femur is also able to bend 90 degrees. These are extreme, so I do not recommend trying these because you may or may not break your hip. I also learned that there's a very uh, there's a few standards in terms of hip replacement joints, and there's very commonly used hip replacement joints. There's a Thompson implant, which is a windowless implant, and it's similar to the Moore implant. While the Moore implant has windows in the stem, and windows are essentially pockets to allow bone growth to occur. And this serves as a natural sealant, a natural lock in a hip replacement joint. Now the Charlie implant uses a smaller head to reduce the friction, and also offers to replace that cedar cup in order to as well also decrease the friction. The Mueller total hip replacement is a slightly modified charmoy, and it's essentially just modifying the general structure of the joint itself. I went into biomechanics a little bit further because I want us to understand the sheer amount of force that a hip truly has to deal with. And I learned that there's forces that act in the X, Y, and Z direction. Now I'll use the pointer again. And in the X direction, forces are acting from the center of the mass of the body into the hip femoral's head. And once this force acts, it gets spread around the hip so that it's not to fracture the top of the femoral head. The force that acts in the Y direction, you'll see back here, is typically the force that acts from walking or moving. It's the force that coming coming from the back side of the hip into the femoral head up front. It's the force that allows you to move and typically occurs when you're walking. Now there's also a force that acts in the Z direction. The primary force in the Z direction is your mass, it's your body weight. And when you're running, when you're walking, when you're jumping, this force can reach up to five times your body weight. And even more in many cases. And that's amazing because essentially your hip is supporting your entire body and it's also capable of dealing with forces that are a lot more than your body's weight, but than your body's mass. Knowing some biomechanics, I also went a little further and I realized that the more head, as well as that acetabular cup, as you'll see here, are angled. Now this angle allows the force on the hip to be reduced so that not just the femoral head is taking all the brunt of the force. Also, if the femoral head was flat and straight, 
it would not be able to hold up the entire mass, the entire weight, the entire mass, because over time it will eventually start cracking and start breaking. So it's key that a hip replacement joint models the same function, the same pattern. And there's also torsional forces exist. Now I know it's not natural to think, but a hip joint, a femur, is actually able to twist slightly. Over time, this twisting is bad, and it's very bad when you have a replacement surgery, especially fresh off of a replacement surgery. Because over time, a torsional force, an excessive torsional force in the hip area after a replacement procedure causes loosening and causes the replacement joint to come undone out of its pocket. And this is bad, so I ran into several issues <coughs> from a biomechanical standpoint. The hip replacement surgery has a lengthy recovery period, and it's more fragile following the procedure, which causes a torsional force to exist. And this torsional force can be very dangerous and very scary at times. Because over time, increasing in torsional force will cause the joints to actually break and loosen out of the socket. So I needed to understand a little bit more about bone mechanics itself. So I researched the structure of bone mechanics, the chemistry, biology behind this to actually understand it. And I learned that lipids are a major structural element and they work hand in hand with proteins to actually create the extracellular cellular matrix. This extracellular matrix, I'll refer to it as ECM so I don't assemble. The ECM is the outermost layer of the bone itself. It works with ATP, and ATP is what catalyzes the growth of the bone and, a and the ECM in the body. Now, a bone, or two bones, when they meet, they can't just meet and say, hey, we're working together now, we're going we're gonna to be bros, basically. <laughs> Essentially, the two bones are held together by muscles, tendons, and ligaments. And these muscle tendons and ligaments form the structure around it. So in your hip and in any place, even in your knee, there's a, a wide network of muscles, tendons, and ligaments that hold everything together. I also learned about bone cells. Now, bone cells are very interesting because they have very fancy names. Osteoblasts are responsible for formation of bones. Osteoclasts are responsible for resorption. It's a fancy term for breaking bones apart, breaking bone cells apart. Now, osteocytes are just bone cells. Those are pretty simple. And I also learned about biocompatibility through this structure. Natural polymers are used most often because they have the natural elements in them. They're not modified, they're not synthetic, they're not naturally produced, they're not, I mean, they are naturally produced. They're not produced in a lab or anything like that. So they have all the natural elements from the environment, every aspect, and they have a greater biological function. They also work well in situ, and in situ just means that inside the body. So they work very well inside the body. There's also been use of collagen and avian source hyalur hyaluronic acid, very fancy word. Um, this avian source hyalur hyaluronic acid has been used to model bones and tissues in the past, and it could be modified to actually serve as a source for a, a possible replacement joint, but hasn't really been tested yet. And I also learned that synthetic materials are very, very common in hip replacement surgeries, and any replacement surgery as well. Polyethylene plastic is, is one of the most commonly used materials, and it's used often in the acid builder cup component of, of the replacement for hips. There's also metals which are often used in a combination, or often straight up titanium. The combination is typically a titanium, stainless steel, and carbon based uh, mixture. Ceramic is also used to model. Now, ceramic is not the preferred material to use because it's typically used for people who are not very active, who do not want to be active in sports, because any brunt impact, any sudden impact on ceramic causes it to break and shatter, which is not good in it. Now, there's also various material combinations that exist. Ceramic implants come in ceramic on metal combination, the ceramic on ceramic, and the ceramic on polyethylene. Essentially, the replacement component is ceramic itself, while the other material that's used with it is the replacing the Cedabeller cup. A lot of times they'll be used in pair two, and they'll be used both for replacing the hip replacement component as well. There's also metal on metal implants, which replaces both components with metal, with met, with a combination of metal or one solid metal. And polyethylene and metal and polyethylene implants also rely on the similar pattern. I also came across cobalt chromium alloys. Cobalt chromium alloys are great materials. They're most commonly used in the finger replacement joint in terms of joint replacement surgeries. But one downside is that hospitals are re regulated very heavily. <coughs> Hospital requires special board approval in order to actually use this material because of its potent ability to 
help with bone growth. Now this is ideal in a situation where a hip is freshly replaced and you want bone to grow back fast, especially when you're relying on windowed implants to allow the bone to grow through. This helps with this helps the bone grow back faster and ultimately helps create a natural walk a lot more faster than typical. And I this got me to my design phase. Originally I had a rough start with design. I didn't I couldn't find any dimensions. Dimensions are very hard to find online on a paper placement joint. And I couldn't find any diagram files or CT images. So I worked closely with my advisor and he actually introduced me to a program, 3D Slicer. 3D Slicer turned out to be a very great free source program that allows you to basically model off of a CT image, a DICOM image, in order to actually create a hip joint or any bone in the body. And this, is, this turned out to be very great. I was a little lost because I had no idea how to use this program, so I, saw, I turned to YouTube for help. And this video turned out, very, turned out to be very handy. I used a feature called a crop volume function to actually uh, locate my specific area. As you'll see here, I actually cut out this, this side of the hip. This model didn't work as well because it asked no model both of them. So I was missing something. And that something was turned out to be segmentation. So I started working with the segmentation tool as well. And working with these two tools, I was able to use the threshold function as you see here to actually define the bone margins right here and ultimately create these models. These aren't my best models, but they still show that I was able to learn how to use this tool in order to actually model the bone function. As in order to actually model the bones in this program. Now, I was, my final 3D model turned out to be very smooth, very still. And I started experimenting the tools to actually get it to look like this over here. I used the, I used the uh, smoothing feature and the joint smoothing feature to actually create it, to make it look like that. The one big drown, downside to 3D Slicer is that it is a free source program, so it is not the most compatible program. I got this message a lot. But I got this middle message a lot, and I learned just to be patient, and it'll work out. Uh, I also was able to create different segment views, and creating segment views allows you to actually take each model that you have and create it in a separate plane, a separate segmentation, essentially. And this came in handy, especially when I was designing, designing multiple, multiple different joints just to see which one had the right smoothness, had the right structure and form most closely to the actual CT image that I was working with. Now, when I actually got to SOLIDWORKS and started designing my initial joint, I had another meeting with my advisor, and he actually recommended something. He, he noticed that I had a single stem right here, and having a single stem is not very good, especially on these contact points right here. These contact points will, over time, lead to fracturing and breaking, and this is not good at all for him. So he recommended that I insert some kind of pockets to allow the bone to, to serve as a natural walk. And I ended up doing that in my later designs. He also introduced me to the Boolean Union subtraction feature, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well. Now when I actually got into my design at SOLIDWORKS and started modifying it, I created these two little pockets, as you'll see here, there's one here and one here. And these little canals link the two pockets together. And essentially these canals allow the bone to go through it. And when you get bone going up and through, it connects together and serves as a natural walk, a natural ceiling. This essentially reduces the amount of cement and bone glue that you need to use in act overall in the, in the actual replacement surgery. This is ideal because it limits the amount of synthetic polymers and non-natural materials that are introduced into the body, which ultimately allows for a greater, more natural fit and fix as well. And this led me to my final design right here. So I started off with this in SOLIDWORKS, and it's essentially just a femur, just the top of the femoral head. And when I got down to it, I actually designed this. It has a stem still, and it has windows on the stem, but there's also two pockets right here. And these two pockets have canals in it, as I showed above. So this is essentially my design. And I was trying to model and mimic the shape, the size, and the overall functionality of an actual femur in order to create a final model that is more natural and more real to what the, real, what the actual paper is. Yeah. And once I actually created my model, I actually started using the Boolean Union tool. This tool was very hard for me to use at first because it wasn't working as I wanted to. I was trying to get the two parts combined, and I'll explain what a Boolean really is. A Boolean Union in SOLIDWORKS takes two parts, two separate parts. So in my case, I took my top of my femur and my replacement joint. I combine them into one. And when I combine them into one, I'll come over here now, and I got this. 
Now this piece, this piece is the top of the femur. This is what the top of the femur would look like after bone growth occurred in my in, in the person. So when bone growth occurred, these canals between the two between the two bone growth pockets would essentially form over, and bone would grow through it. This serves up the natural lock that I was looking for, and this essentially led me to realize that I was modeling the actual shape, the actual size, and keeping the same functionality. And I was creating a natural lock because of that. And this is this Boolean union tool is actually modeled this natural lock that I was trying to create. I wanted to run stress simulations in SolidWorks, but stress simulations, as many of you will attest, are very difficult to run. They're very problematic, especially when you've never done them. And I spent a large, large portion of my time actually learning how to do them. When I got down to it, this message became very common on my computer screen. It got a mesh error. The mesh failed to run. And every time, it kept telling me to do a shrink fit contact. Every time I ran a shrink fit contact, it came out like this. But with the shrink fit contact, I ran the mesh and I got the same error. So I was going back in a circle. And then I was using the mesh tool advisor wizard and it told me to work on my aspect ratio. And I was trying to work on my aspect ratio. And can you guys guess what happened? I got the same error. <laughs> so I'm still actively trying to get that to work, and I hope to get that to work soon, ideally. But I was able to actually get a cost analysis to work. Now, I know a typical hip replacement joint weighs about three to five pounds. And I ran a cost analysis on three different materials. I ran this basic cost analysis on ceramic, and I found that ceramic costs $169.57 producing my joint. I also ran a cost analysis on carbon fiber, and carbon fiber costs $164.60. When I ran cobalt cr uh, a chromium cost analysis, I was shocked to find that it cost $46.48. That really amazed me. That cobalt, a metal, is a, co a metal is very cheap. I mean, I'm sorry, chromium, a metal, is very cheap. That surprised me. Great. Now, uh, as anybody will attest, they have their share of a box and it falls throughout the project. I originally wanted to work on designing four joints, four separate joints, and that was very unrealistic in my span of a year. But I also want, had issues finding dimensions of the hip joint, and I couldn't find any free source diagram files online that actually ran with Slicer 3D, 3D Slicer. I also had issues with running 3D Slicer in SolidWorks, and I was unable to get simulations to run, but I had some issues with Boolean Union as well, and it took more time than I had originally anticipated. And that leads me into my timeline. Now you'll notice there's gonna be a lot of color on here, and I will attest I'm not the best with color, so I'll try my best and walk you through it. Um, so I did say that I started this project on April 2nd, 2018. So nothing at the beginning of my timeline has changed. I still did my initial research last semester, and I still did my career comparison at the beginning of the 2018-2019 uh, school year. Not actually happened. And then my initial project presentation still occurred around, I still occurred, and I still did work around the same period here. I also researched the finger replacement joint, and that's what I originally wanted to do, so I stayed on track there, which is good. Which you'll notice is not the case for the rest of my project. On October 8th through the 11th, I wanted to keep working on researching the finger replacement, and I also wanted to finish my materials research after fall break, originally. But you'll see that there's another color that popped up here. This goldish color in the middle is my revised timeline. After I met with my advisor, I realized that four joints is just insane. I'm never going to get it done, and it's never going to work. So I went and created a revised timeline. In my revised timeline, I still did my initial presentation on the 8th through 11th. And I still did, but I actually changed it to do with finger replacement. So I already started, and I just wanted to finish it and see it through. And I'm really glad I did, because I found that cobalt chrome material. Cobalt chromium alloy, which is great with bone growth. Now, I still did that on my actual timeline, which is good because I'm straight to my I'm, I'm right on track for my revised uh, timeline, or so I thought. Now, you'll see that the middle color disappeared because I was actually doing what I wanted, doing almost what I wanted to, because my revised timeline and my actual timeline turned out to be exactly the same at this point, which is good so far. We're doing good. Now, October 31st through December 3rd, I originally wanted to run flow simulation and learn how to use it, as well as design my entire hip in this period. And then December 5th to January 14th, I wanted to design my knee joints, run flow simulation, and 3D printing. I was being bold. Now, November 2nd to the 12th, I actually changed that and this actually worked on finishing my hip replacement research. I finished the majority of it in April and May of 2018, 
But I want to go back and expand upon it. And I learned some very interesting things, especially about biomechanics and the overall bone structure that is associated with the hip. And then I went back and November 14th to December 7th, I focused on research in chemistry and biology as well as biocompatibility, which is crucial when you're designing a joint of this nature that goes inside the human body. Biocompatibility turned out to be very key. And I also expanded my materials now, here's where the gold comes back. December 5th to January 14th, I already discussed was my knee, entire, was entirely on my knee. And then January 6th to March 4th, I wanted to do the same thing I've been doing for the hip and the knee, but just do it for an ankle now, because why not? And then my middle revised timeline, I changed the de December 8th to January 7th to learn stress simulations. I actually spent more time learning stress simulations than I thought I would need, and clearly my learning was not enough because I did not get it to work eventually. And for January 8th to March 4th, I actually focused on designing the hip and selecting material and running stress simulations. Now my revised timeline did not account for me learning how to use 3D slicer. And so on my actual timeline, I did do what I wanted to do during this period of December 8th to January 7th. But I had to add designing the hip joint on 3D Slicer because I did not plan on using this program originally. But it's a great program, and it's a great program, especially if you want to model based off my biomedical devices based off specific patient information. But I did not account for learning this program originally. I also spent time trying to convert STL file, which is what's created in 3D Slicer, into an SLD DRT file for SOLIDWORKS use. And from March 6th to 29th, uh, I was originally saying, hey, I'm going to produce everything right now, and I'm going to take my entire CSWP exam during this time. Because why not? You, you can easily do all the, produce three joints and take a three-part test in a month. And for April 2nd to the 17th, I was going to work on my entire presentation for today. Now, March 6th to the 29th, I wasn't wrong. I wa my revised timeline wanted to produce joints, actually singular, one joint this time. So I was only focusing on the hip on my revised timeline. And I was still going to take an entire three-part test and practice and prepare for it in that month. And my revised timeline still allotted the majority of April for my final presentation preparation. Now, here's what actually happened, and this is a big change. Now, from March 6th to the 29th, I actually focused on problem solving and resolving issues that I had with the requester and software in the overall function and structure of my hip replacement joint. And then I actually tried to get the bullying unit to work, which took a lot longer than I anticipated. It took the second half of March, <coughs> a little bit into April even. And I was trying to work on my stress simulations at this time. It turns out I'm not very good at stress simulations, and I need a lot of more learning on practice about with stress simulations before I actually consider myself somewhat decent at it. And this actually led me into April, where I actually started researching bioprinting and 3D bioprinting. And this research on bioprinting came out of my meeting with my advisor when he showed me the lab at Steve Denver and walked me through what they were doing and the research that they were doing with creating a 3D bioprinter. And I was very interested in it would be pretty cool to print the bone on a 3D printer, I'd say. And I was also still working on stress simulations as well as my cost analysis. Clearly my stress simulations still get me trouble. And I also managed to somehow get ready for today in this period while doing stress simulations and bioprinting. So I'm very happy with that. Now, of course, I had some solutions that I came up with throughout my project. I was, one was focusing on only one joint. Because I was focusing on one joint, I had a lot less pressure on my back. Designing three joints in the span of a year, testing them, and 3D printing them, turned out to be very insane and very unrealistic for what I was able to do at this current time. I was also grateful to have very helpful advisors throughout this project. And Reaching out to them and having help was great, very beneficial throughout the entirety of my project. And I also came up with a potential idea of what I want to do next year, what I plan on doing in the future, which is this. Next year, I want to apply for, potentially apply for research grants and work with faculty advisors to truly continue my project. I want to focus more on the 3D print, bioprinting aspect of this project. I want to figure out how to 3D print drones and how to model bones to actually mimic the shape of an actual hip in the body in order to create the best possible material and the best possible replacement joint that will ultimately provide the longest lifespan of the joint inside the human body, as well as decrease the pain and increase the overall patient outcome that exists in such a procedure. And with that, are there any questions? Okay.
really familiar with the reading pleasure, but yeah. is, uh, how would you plan on changing the size and the shape of that if, depending on the patient? Um, so the, the unique thing about 3D Slicer is that it relies based on the CT image that it, you import into it. So it just really relies on the CT image that you import. Yes, yeah, so that's the great thing about the threshold tool in 3D Slicer is that you're able to actually select your margins and select the clarity of your margins in 3D Slicer, which proves beneficial, especially when you're modeling versus in Asia. Yeah. Question? Question? I got one. Yeah. Um, so your, your design, you've got those channels in there, and we're using the Boolean tool to basically cut those out of the femur. How would the surgeon actually do that? So ideally, the surgeon wouldn't cut out the entirety of this. He'd be able to like leave a little bit on top. And the great thing about bone is that it actually grows back relatively fast. And so my design is essentially opting to minimize the use of cement, because cement is still used to some extent in procedures. But I'm trying to opt. I'm trying to minimize the use of this as well. Okay, thank you. Good job, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So um, your design has a protruding piece to it, correct? Yeah. Does that go into the bone marrow as part of the solution? And then how do you address the, the lip that would occur with the two bones in the Right, yeah, my design has a little stem in it, and this stem is just to provide a secondary secure block point, because you can't secure it with just one little piece. So I opted to keep a stem in my design in order to actually provide a more natural block to it, and just for security purposes as well, the hip. And addressing the lock would essentially be choosing the right material that's more naturally receptive in the body. Now, cobalt chromium alloys are great, but there's also a possibility of modulus mismatches occurring, which my advisor actually mentioned to me. <laughs> but yeah, there's a possibility of modulus mismatch occurring, but it's essentially just choosing the right material that works the best in the body. Now, ideally it would be like 3D printing your bone, essentially, and injecting this 3D print with stem cell. And doing so would allow it to take the most natural form and the most natural shape of the actual hip that it's trying to mimic, essentially. So that would fill in the, in any lip or smooth yeah, there is. Ideally, yes. Ideally, I would I would imagine that 3D printing bone in this nature would allow it to essentially become part of the actual hip, because it would be modeling the same chemical properties and bio biological properties of the actual bone that's currently there. Hmm. Cool. All right. Well, thank you.